Good afternoon. Today I am here with Dr. Hank Dallum. We work together at Orthodontic Care of Georgia. And the reason that I wanted to sit down and talk with Dr. Dallum is because he has a very inspirational story. So he is going to take it from there and uh, tell us about himself. Thank you, Dina. Good to be here. I appreciate the invite. Um, yeah, I, uh, I am an orthodontist. I work with Dina here at Orthodontic Care Georgia, and um, I've been associated with them for well, a couple of years. A couple of years now. I um, uh, am originally from Western Kentucky. I practiced orthodontics there, started in 1984, and practiced with my dad for about uh, 11 years, and then he retired, and then I took over as uh, um, uh, sole owner, sole individual practice, individual owner, just a one-person uh, office, and then uh, came down here to Georgia in uh, 2002. Um, I didn't necessarily come down, so I was in practice uh, for, what is that, 18 years or so by myself. And so um, I didn't come down here quite voluntarily. I came to uh, Atlanta uh, in July of 2002 to go to rehab uh, for um, addiction to, uh, to opioids and narcotics. And um, I uh, had been uh, ordering them online, or the narcotic pills. It wasn't writing any prescriptions, but um, I was ordering them, and uh, the DEA and the board, an investigator from the DEA and the board of dentistry, showed up in my office one day with guns and badges, and wanted wanted to know why an orthodontist needed all of those narcotics. And I said, well, they're thinking that, that I was selling them or the quantity that I was using. Um, but, um, you know, I told them that they were all for me. And they said, well, you know, you need to um, either go get help or lose your license. So uh, the choice was uh, fairly obvious. So I came down here came to a, a treatment center called Metro Atlanta Recovery Residence, MAR is the acronym for it, and um, stayed there for about uh, 18 months. And during that time, um, uh, Kentucky had suspended my license, so I couldn't practice. And obviously I didn't have a Georgia license, so I couldn't practice in Georgia either. And um, while I was at Mar, I had lots of things going on that I had sort of ignored and not sort of had ignored and lots of uh, things that had happened that, that finally caught up with me. I ended up uh, getting a divorce, ended up declaring bankruptcy and losing the house, the office, the uh, everything. And I uh, was essentially homeless except for living in the, in the halfway house. Uh, at Mar, and so um, <clears throat> after the first um, 60 or so days um, of kind of inpatient therapy, what they want you to do is find a job. So, uh, and so I was able to find a job. I found a job at Tuesday morning, the retail retail store. Uh, started out uh, at six dollars and fifty cents an hour, unloading. Um, semi trucks full of boxes of merchandise and I will say 53 feet is a long is a long way I didn't realize how many boxes of 50 through 53 foot trailer will hold but um, we would unload those and then stock the shelves and so I was uh, working um, working there um, and uh, you know, I had to have an 18 year old show me how to work the cash register. I was 50 at the, at the time when I first came down here. Um, and so uh, it, uh, it was very humbling, needless to say, but um, I started out, like I said, unloading the trucks and, and, um, and stocking shelves, but I worked my way up. I became the head 
um, the head assistant, then I became the assistant manager, and then I became the manager. Mm. So I was managing a uh, retail store, um, and uh, uh, anyway, ended up ended up staying uh, at Tuesday morning, working there for almost three years, 30, wow. 34 months I was out of practice uh, and wasn't practicing orthodontics and and so and actually it was great it was it was probably the best best thing I've ever done um, because it um, put a lot of changed a lot of things priority wise mm-hmm. and what was important I remember it, this was back when gas went up way up there for almost four dollars a gallon mm-hmm. of, you know it was three dollars three high threes and um, you know, I had to work one hour for two gallons of gas. Wow. So it put a, put a lot of things in perspective. And, and actually, I was very happy doing what I was doing. Um, it was stress-free mm-hmm. for the most part. You know, <coughs> excuse me. For the most part, it was stress-free. And, you know, I just showed up and, and you know, my jeans and tennis shoes and, and did the retail thing and um, while I was still at Mar, still living there. Um, when I left Mar, I moved into a house with um, some other uh, addicts. And so um, I was still working there at, at Tuesday morning for about another six months or so. And um, uh, I also, attend, during this time, the um, the Georgia Dental Association has a dental recovery network for all dentists that that have gotten in trouble or have issues with the board or um, and then have to have a what's called a consent order the board says the board says you can practice or you can do this as long as you do the following um, go to meetings and there's a Wednesday night support group and various things that you have to have to do random drug screens and things along that line so that was going on on Wednesday night and I was I was going to that even though I wasn't practicing mm. um, and there is part of the requirement um, from uh, from Mara was to attend that that group <clears throat> and so um, I remember going to I was asked to go if I wanted to go to the Hinman mm-hmm. the big international dental meeting held in Atlanta and I really didn't want to, um, mainly because of shame and just because, you know, I, it, I, I, I wasn't quite ready for that. I knew that, you know, I, it, you know, I knew I was so important that everybody was going to be pointing their finger, finger at me and, uh, because there were several companies there that I had to list on my bankruptcy petition. And so I just knew they'd see my name tag and, and know me, so which was crazy, but in my mind, that's what was going on. But anyway, I decided to go. This um, this friend that was in the group on Wednesday night offered to pay to, to get me to go. Um, and so I went and I kind of got the juices flowing again that, well, maybe I do want to do orthodontics again. And so I ended up um, deciding to do that, which meant uh, I had to retake the general dental boards in order to get my license in Georgia, uh, and which uh, I had not done general dentistry, I had not picked up a handpiece, I had not done a crown, I had not done fillings or anything like that in 23 years. Wow. So I had to uh, go back and take the, uh, the dental board over again, ended up passing all but one section of it. Um, I had one of the crowns, I had to cut it, it looked like I cut it with a chainsaw. Um, <laughs> it wasn't real good, but I had, I had spent probably six months in um, another person's office that was in our dental group on Wednesday night. He offered to tutor me and help me um, you know, learn to do everything all over again and, and all gave me his office, um, you know, let me practice in his office and, and so because we practice on extracted with extracted teeth mm-hmm. because I don't have a license so I can't practice any other any other way. So anyway, make a long story short, I ended up passing the whole board and then went and then applied for the license. And then um, the, the Georgia Board of Dentistry turned me down. 
after all of that and passing the board, um, they uh, this they turn me down and they don't give you a reason. They just say, "Here you go." Uh, and so, um, so anyway, I uh, petition them. They let you come before them, and and you know ask, ask you know they granted me a, a about a ten minute audience. So I go before the board, and and I have this little prepared statement. But anyway, the board never changes its mind, and they they once they rule on something, it's pretty iron ironclad. So. But I had to, uh, I went and kind of told them my story. Uh, and so anyway, they did change their mind, which is probably the first time that they've ever done anything like that. Then they decided to give me a license. And so in July of 2005, I went back to practice. Um, that's almost three years to the to the date that uh, that I came down to Atlanta to go to rehab, and um, you know I've been practicing um, ever since. Um, I've been I came work for uh, a group, and then uh, they sold to a larger DSO and worked for them, and then um, I worked and went to work as an associate, and then I ended up uh, working for Delta Dental insurance company I went to the dark side and, <laughs> and, yes. and worked for the worked for the insurance company and um, and then I was contacted by um, the guy that put this deal together between Cedar and, and orthodontic care of Georgia and um, asking they want to know if I wanted to review charts and so just in my spare time that they needed somebody to do a little due diligence on that so I said sure I'll do that at night <laughs> who knew? Who knew? Yeah, <laughs> boy. And then uh, now you have your your office exactly, in Augusta. <laughs> exactly. And and so I agreed to do that for a couple of nights. You know, just review like thirty charts a week or something like that. And so um, then the the head of the of the group left, and they and they were left without a uh, without an orthodontist with a license. A Georgia license and so I was in the wrong place at the wrong time I was the only one around that this <laughs> private equity people knew that had a Georgia license because they can't own mm -hmm. a dental group in the state of Georgia because they don't have a license somebody with a license has to do that so that was uh, that became me so um, by default yeah by <laughs> default um, here I am as the director of orthodontics and OCG so uh, July 8th, um, the, uh, July 9th, sorry, of the next month will be uh, 19 years um, since I have had a drink or a drug. And so it's, it's been a, you know, as the Grateful Dead would say, it's been a long, strange trip. And, well, congratulations uh, on that. Thank you. Thank you. What, what started you, though? Why did you begin that, begin ordering drugs? It was... You know, they, um, it's, it's it, basically the reason, the reason most people, it's the same reason most people use drugs and most people use alcohol is to change the way you feel. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and, and so it, it, it uh, uh, just enabled me to do more and be more outgoing and, and, um, and also it was a way to just numb and you know, I had put an inordinate amount of pressure on myself. It was more, uh, it was all me. It wasn't my dad or my mom or anything like that. But coming back to the town that I was raised in, working with my dad, and all the you know, being Doctor Dallum and you know, Doctor Dallum's son, and mm -hmm. things along that line, that it was just, um, I just you know. I got to the point where you know uh, there was just a lot of a lot of pressure from that standpoint. Small town coming back, and you know, I honestly not really wanting to be there. Mm -hmm. I went back to practice with my dad because it was expected. Mm -hmm. It was kind of the easy way, but I didn't really want to. Um, I just I did, but I didn't have enough guts to say you know I don't want to do this, and so. Um, I went back and, you know, kids came and, you know, we had kids and responsibilities and 
all the other stuff, and so it was a it was a way to it was a way to hide, mm -hmm. and um, so it was a, just a great numbing agent, so that I didn't have to uh, to deal with things. And how long did that go on until you got caught? Oh gosh. Um, well, I had gotten caught a couple of times before. I went to uh, treatment when I first got back. Went to the very first treatment was in 1980, um, uh, 84, the, um, December of, of 84. And, um, and I went and, um, and then uh, got out and then it went again in like 90. Mm -hmm. So it had been going on for a long time. I, when I do tell our story, um, you know, one of the things that I point out is that I'd been at this for a long time. It's the very first time I got out of treatment. You get out for what they call TLs or therapeutic leaves. Mm. And so I got out of uh, the very first treatment I got out for my youngest son's first birthday. And then this last treatment I got out on a TL for his high school graduation. So it's been a long, a long road. I've been been fighting this uh, uh, off and on, and um, what really changed this time was this time there were consequences. It was very, very serious consequences. The other time it was things were covered up by my wife at the time, by my you know parents, by friends, and things were overlooked and. You know, hush hush, and then that kind of thing. But um, I stayed at it long enough to where there were some very serious consequences that, you know, got my um, attention, and it was continue on and probably die or or uh, or get get help. It became it became very obvious that. Um, uh, that I was uh, pretty powerless over it all. That um, you know that my life had become unmanageable. It's just the first step in the in the AA thing is that you have to admit that you know your life was unmanageable, and so that's it was pretty unmanageable, and so uh, that's that's why it's you know worked or is working. Mm -hmm. That and and. I have an extremely strong network here, uh, support network, um, you know, uh, and uh, I still go to the Wednesday night group. Um, I, I don't have to, I still do because that's what keeps me sober. Mm -hmm. um, I still do random urine screens once a month. Um, it's just, I've been doing that for 19 years. It's just, uh, it, it's, it's just good insurance policy because you know you never know. Um, you know you could be in a car wreck or something happen, and you know they find they they look your history up and and you know see that you know you've been to treatment or um, and uh, so now you know and so they could use that against you. So now I've got you know I have all this track record of of being clean, and then I you know. Try not to hide from it anymore, and you know, do things like this, and it, it helps remind me of where I came from, and that I really don't want to go back there again. It's funny once you're open about something, and it's no longer in the dark, then it, it just feels like this weight has been lifted. Yeah, it's the shame of it all. It, it's been the hardest thing to to overcome. Um, you know, alcoholism and drug addiction is a disease it's it's um it, it's it's the way our some people's bodies are just different than others it's like you know the pills that i took the narcotics that i took somebody might say oh i can't take those because you know it makes me sick or i don't like the way it makes me feel <laughs> and i'm like what right. what do you mean you don't like the way you feel that's the best thing there is about it so in our bodies, it acts it acts a lot different, and then we get this mental obsession that gotta have it, gotta have it, gotta have it, gotta have it, um, and so um, the shame really comes from the fact that that you know you think you're you're a bad person, you're not a 
good person doing a bad thing. You're, you're, you know, you're a bad person for doing this. And so a lot of it was all self-imposed shame. And um, uh, so that to me, for me, was the hardest, hardest thing to, to overcome in there. And, but talking about it and going to groups and trying to help others and that kind of thing is, um, is what has helped uh, alleviate some of that of that shame. Um, it's still there. There's still, you know, there's there's still times that you know, definitely feel less than, and definitely, um, you know, try to compare my my insides to other people's outsides, and and um, so you know, there's there's still times of, that there is a little bit of the shame, but um, you know, there, it's few and far between these days and like I said and like you said talking about it takes the secret out of it and you know you don't have to uh, uh, tippy toe around um, mm -hmm. in there and uh, wonder well is it, what are they going to find out what are they going to think if they if they find out if you just if you just throw it out there uh, it's easy number one it's easier on you and number two when you throw it out there most people are shocked and they don't know yeah they either they either can relate or they got somebody in their family that's addicted mm -hmm. or it shuts them up real quick mm -hmm. because they don't know what to say so um it's uh, uh that that part of it is is good that's that's part of the therapeutic part of it is just talking about it well thank you very much certainly for taking your time you're more than welcome so, glad to do it like i said it's it's uh, part of the part of the deal. Um, well, thank you for watching, and I hope you subscribe because you just never know what topics and what people um, you may get to meet on this channel. Don't be afraid to ask for help. That's right. Thank you. Bye.